Um, well, first of all, thank you, Ahmed, for, for inviting me to give a talk in, in this seminar. So yes, I'm going to talk about the edge vector of a metroid complex, mainly about paving metroids and co-graphic metroids. So let me start by, uh, by giving the definition I'm using of metroids. For me, a metroid is going to be a pair. We have a finite set E, and uh, that is the ground set of the metroid, and a collection of subsets of E that are called the independent sets of the metroid. They have to satisfy three axioms. The first is that the empty set is, is an independent set. And the second one is that if you have an independent set and any subset of that independent set is also independent. So with these two, with these two uh, axioms, what we have is that um, the, the set of independent sets, they define a simplicial complex. And the third action is that it brings the metro, metro aspect to the, to the structure. That is that if you have two independent sets and one is bigger than the other one, then you should be able to find an element in the big one that is not in the small one uh, in such a way that the small one by adding this, this element E makes a bigger independent set. So in my head, I will have this lattice of subsets of the set E and in yellow, I will, there will be the independent sets. So with this definition, um, you will also can, can get uh, other, uh, other um, ways to define the metroid. For example, if you just consider the maximal independent sets, they will also define the set of independent sets. So uh, this will define the metroid and these maximal independent sets are called the bases of the metroid. Uh, it can be proved that all these bases are, all have the same cardinality. Uh, so this common cardinality is the rank of the metroid. So I'm going to denote by R of M. The other structure I can also define the metroid is the minimal subsets uh, that there are not independent and that we are going to call, uh, that are called silks. Uh, by the way, I'm mainly concerned about the, the, the complex induced by the, uh, by the independent sets. So that's why I'm not putting the, the loops of the metroid. So let's think that uh, we, we consider those metrics without loops. Later on, I'm going to tell you what, what, what will happen with the loops. So we are considering this implicit uh, complex uh, coming from metroids, and there are two um, related invariants uh, of simplicial complexes. One is the phase enumerator. So you have a D minus one dimensional simplicial complex, then you, you construct this polynomial um, F of X, that will be the sum that you can compute by, by, uh, by adding, uh, uh, the term x to the d minus the size of f for every phase of the simplicial complex. So when you write this as a power of, um, as a polynomial in powers of x, so the term x to the d minus i will, uh, will have coefficient fi, and that will be the number of phases of cardinality i. And now you can you can just consider the these coefficients and they and thus define uh, that defines a vector called the f vector, and so that's 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 one of the the, the structures we want. Um, but we are mainly concerned about simplicial complex where all the, the the facets have the same cardinality. These are called pure simplicial complex, and so we are mainly concerned about those. Relevant to this. Then is a result of Lenz in 2013 that says that this sequence, this F vector is actually long concave for metroid complexes of a representable metroid. The second, the second um, uh, invariant is the shelling polynomial. So when you have a pure simplicial complex, like in our case, then a shelling is an order of the facets of the, of the simplicial complex, F1, F2, up to Ft, in such a way that the facets met, met the, the complex generated by the previous uh, faces, uh, facets in a non-void union of maximal proper faces. So uh, a complex is going to be shellable if it, admits, if it is pure and admits a shelling. And um, there's a quantity associated in this shelling to every, every facet. If you consider delta i to be uh, the subcomplex generated by the, by the first i facets in, in the shelling, 
Um, then you can find uh, a unique minimal phase of Fi that we are going to denote it by R of Fi that lies in delta i, but it wasn't before, it wasn't in delta i minus one. So with that definition, you can construct a polynomial called the Schelling polynomial, H of x, that is, uh, you have the term x to the d minus this, the cardinality of this, this phase R of Fi, and you add these terms for all the phases, all the facets in the, in the Schelling. So when you write this polynomial as a power of x, then you get the term x to the d minus i, and that will have coefficient h i. And then you form with these coefficients another uh, sequence of numbers, and that will be the h vector of, this, of, the, of the shellable simplicity complex. Again, related to this, to this seminar will be the, the result of who in 2015, that says that the h vector of uh, is long concave for uh, for for a metroid complex that comes from a metroid representable over a field of characteristic zero. So, as an example, let's consider this one-dimensional complex that is pure. So, all the facets will have size two. We have six facets. We have four faces of size one, and then we have the empty set. So the phase enumerator will be x squared plus 4x plus 6, and the, and the f vector will be 1, 4, 6. This uh, simplicial complex is pure and it's actually shareable. So what you do is you take first, you order the, the, the facets lexicographically. So first you will get the facet 1, 2. The corresponding R for that facet will be the empty set. Then you add the next one that will be one three, and uh, in the the corresponding R of that uh, facet will be three. That, that's that's the new phase in, in the in the complex. Then you you add one four the, fa the facet one four, and then the the R of one four will be four. Then when you add uh, two three, then uh, that actually is the ho the whole facet is 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 the is the minimal new one. So that's, that's, um, that's the R, R of, of that phase, the facet is himself, is the facet itself. And you keep on going, doing this. So you get the polynomial of this uh, simplicial complex, this is x plus three. And the h vector will be one, two, three. This actually will correspond to the to the matroidal complex coming from the the, the uniform metro U24. Um, in 1970, Magnoli proved that there was a relation between these two invariants. Actually, f of x is h of x plus one, and so from this we obtained something. Well, we obtained two many things, but uh, two things that are relevant for my talk is that well the sum of the terms in the h vector of course, is, is the number of facets of the simplicial complex. But also the, the terms HK are just a binomial transformation of the FIs. So I will use this later. So just, just to, 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 to be precise, so once you have a metroid, you get a simplicial complex I'm going to call the, the, the metroid complex. Of the, of the metroid uh, will be uh, of dimension the rank of the metroid minus one. It will be pure, no? All the faces will have size the rank of the metroid. And it was proved in 1977 by Proven that this, uh, uh, this imperial complex, this metroid complex is actually shelling. And the shelling is just um, uh, ordering the bases because the bases will be the facets of the, of the simplicial complex. We will be ordering the bases lexicographic. So these uh, metroid complexes are, are, are always shared. So we want to, to, to know how does this H um, vector or F vector, because we can get one from the other one for uh, different classes of metroids. And let me start with paving metroids. So paving metroids are metroids where all the, the, um, all the circuits have size at least the rank of the metroid. So in my picture, everything below the rank of the metroid of size less than the rank of the metroid will be independent and everything above will be dependent. 
So the classical example to give in a Metroid, uh, Metroid talk will be to consider the Fano Metroid, and the Fano Metroid is a paving Metroid. The Fano Metroid is a rank three Metroid on seven elements, and is um, it comes from the projective geometry of dimension two over GF two. So we have seven points, the, the seven elements of the Fano Metroid, the seven points in the geometry, and the circuits of size three, because it's a, it's a, a simple rank two, uh, rank three, uh, Rank uh, three metroid is um, are the seven lines in the projective geometry that I uh, that I put there that I list there. No? These are the seven lines, and there will be the circuits of size three in the metroid, and the rest will be independent sets. So this is an example of a paving metroid. So. What is the importance of paving metroids? Oh, so in 1973, Blackburn, Crapo, and Hicks, he produced a catalog of what they call combinatorial geometries, or what we can call uh, simple metroids. And they make a catalog for, for these simple metroids up to eight elements. And three years later, Dominic Welch asked if, uh, well, he noticed that in this catalog, most metros were paving. So he asked if, well, that's true in general, if most, most metros are paving. In 2008, this catalog got increased by, by up to nine elements by Mayhew and Royley. And they also checked that, yeah, in, even in, with all, all these new metros, they were most, most of them, they were paving. So in 2010, uh, we have that Mayhew, Newman, Welsh, and Whittle, they actually conjecture that asymptotically most metroids are paid. So there are some partial results about this conjecture. Uh, one that I, I noticed when I was preparing this lecture is one of 2015 on Pendavik and Van Der Poel that relates the, um, the log of the number of total, uh, total number of metroids on n elements and the log of the total number of uh, paving metrics on n elements, and to be precise, they, they talk about the sparse paving metrics. So it will be paving metrics where the where the circuits has a symmetric difference for any two circuits, any two uh, circuits of of size the rank of the metric will have a symmetric difference of four. So. And um, how is the edge uh, vector of a paving metroid? Well, actually, it's not difficult to, to, to compute it because the F vector of a paving metroid is very easy. So everything below the rank of the metroid is independent. So the, the, the number of, of, um, of faces in the, in the simplicial complex will be precisely uh, the, the binomial coefficient n in k. No, for k less than the rank of the metro minus one. So um, the last term will be well the number of facets, that is the number of bases of the metric. So that's that's the F vector. If you know the number of elements, well, if you, you have a, a rank R uh, paving metric with n elements and you know the number of bases, then you know the F vector. So Griel, um, I have a question. Um, yes. So are most uh, like what? Are paving metroids representable in general? Ah, that's, that's a good question. In, um, and no, I mean, I don't know the precise result. I don't know if James is here, but uh, I, I, I will say that most paving metroids are not representable. No, that's, that's, that's a very different class. Yeah, there's a result of Peter Nelson that proves that most metroids are not representable. No, but they're paving metrics. He, he meant paving metrics. If most paving metrics are not representable, I will say that, yeah, but I don't know if it's, there's a result like yeah, that. I don't, think, I don't think Peter's result does paving metrics specifically, but um, most metrics are not representable. And I guess is if most metrics are paving metrics, then that means most yeah. paving metrics are not representable. Yeah, I will think the same. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I think that's right. I, I think he showed that there are not enough. Uh, representable matroids for all paving matroids to be represented. Like, there are lots and lots more. Uh, sorry, there are not enough representable matroids. There are lots and lots more paving matroids than there are representable. Yeah. Matrix. Yeah. Okay. So, 
So I'm going to consider paving method with no loops for, for the reason I, I mentioned, no, it, they, they, they don't intervene in the, in, the, in, the, in the simplicial complex, but also I'm going to consider um, paving methods without co-loops because the co-loops, what they do is that they, they make your simplicial complex, so you have a simplicial complex, let's say like that, then the co-loop, what it makes is just makes this into a, a cone with that element. So all the information is really uh, with with the metric with uh, the that that element contracted, and actually in the in the edge um, vector or the edge polynomial, what you are doing just is just making a shift when when you you consider metric with loops or multiplying by x the the edge the shelling polynomial. So um, I'm just going to concentrate in, in no loops or loops. So now using the relations, oh, there's a bit of a slack. Okay. Using the relation between the FIs and the HIs is um, well some, somehow easy to, 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 to find the H vector. Again, the first R terms are going to be well easy. There will be these binomial coefficients. And the last term, well, we know that it has to add to the number of bases. So it will be the number of bases minus the sum of the previous term that also add to, to a binomial coefficient. So if you have a rank R, R paving metric and you know the basis, then you can compute the H vector. And here is when we can, uh, we ent it enters another uh, structure that is the one of the multi-complexes. And for that, I notice that these terms HK are of the form N minus R minus one plus K in K. So this expression corresponds to the number of monomials over N minus R variables of degree K. When, when in this case for the, for the H vector of the payments will be between zero and R minus one. So the, that's, that's the, the, the monomials in the variables that enters the place. So for that, I'm going to define, uh, uh, I'm going to consider uh, the ring of integer polynomials over the variables. And I'm just going to consider in this, um, the set of all monic monomials over the variables with as a poset. So the relation will be the divisibility relation that is between, that is between uh, polynomials. So with that, I can define a multi-complex that is some sort of generalization of a simplicial complex that is just a subset of these monomials, no, in this poset, which is closed under divisibility. So if all the maximal elements of these multi-complex have the same degree, then you also say that this multi-complex is pure. So you can think of multi-complexes as a, as a multi-set generalization of simplicial complexes. And here I show you an example of, um, of a multi-complex it has uh, two variables and the maximal, the, it is pure and the maximal degree is four. There's another example. Here is, uh, we have three variables and uh, the, it's, it's also pure and the maximal degree is again four. So you can check, uh, well, if you want to, that, um, that we have all the monomials of degree up to three and they, and they are all covered by, by at least one monomial of degree four, not one of the six that I put there in, in purple. So we can think of these multi-complexes and consider what's the, the related notion of F vector, and that will be uh, the one of O sequence. So an integer sequence is an O sequence if there exists a multi-complex, with HI, so the, the, the term HI is the number of monomials of degree I. And, I, and, and this sequence will be called pure if the multi-complex is pure. So in, with all, so, yeah. in our example, we will have 10, a pure of sequence one, two, three, four, three. And with the other example, we have the pure of sequence one, three, six, ten, six. So what has to do this with, with metroids? Well, there's a conjecture from 1977 of Richard Stanley that says that uh, the edge vector of a metroid complex is actually a pure O sequence. So it, will, it took some time, but uh, the, in 1997, uh, 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 the work on, on chip firing game of Norman Bix and my contribution make, uh, make uh, construct, well, it, from that you can construct a proof for co-graphic metrics. 
So it took another, some, uh, another number of years, but in 2010, it was also proved the conjecture for lattice pad metrics. And then there was a, a series of results in 2012, uh, Koo proved for graphic metrics of cone graphs, that means graphs with an apex. In 2012, uh, Steve Noble, uh, Ramirez, Ibanez, and Villarreal Flores and myself, we proved for paving metrics. For rank three metroids, co rank two metroids, and all metroids with at most nine elements, it was proved by De Loera, Kemper, and Kinn, also in 2012. So it was a good year for, for the conjecture. In 2012, there's, there's another proof of the rank three metroids by Haas, Tox, and Sanello. And uh, the same year, Suho proved for co transversal metroids, and Sarmiento gave a, a different proof, uh, a bit more recent. Um, in 2014, Constantinesco, Cali, and Barbaro, they proved for the truncation of a metroid, for generalized catalyst metroids, and for rank D metroids where the HD, that means the last entry of the H vector, is at most phi. For rank four metroid was proved in 2015 by Clean and Samper. And well, then there's, there's of course, there's, there's quite a lot of more results uh, on, on the smaller classes. But for example, I, I just uh, dig up this, this, well, I just, when I, prepare, I was preparing the lecture, I noticed this, this result. It was also proved in 2021 that by Crawford, Dutchman, Haycock, Marsh, Hu, and Truman, uh, the, the case of graphic matrix for bicon graphs. So there are graphs with two uh, apices. So um, what happened with the paving metrics with all proof of, for paving metrics? Well, to prove the conjecture for paving metrics is actually enough to prove that there is a multi-complex, of course, that's, that's obvious. So essentially what I want to say here is that the quantity HR, that is the last term of the H vector actually fits in the multi-complex that is actually uniquely determined by the, the previous uh, entries. But, but, but what do I mean by that? So the, 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 the first R minus uh, one terms in the H vector of a paving metroid will give you a unique multicomplex. If it is realizable, it has to be this multicomplex that we call it full multicomplex MRD. And it's the, the pure multicomplex in which you have uh, as maximal elements all the monomials of degree R and D in the term. So this multi-complex will realize this O sequence, no? that, is, uh, that is the one of the binomial coefficients. So that, that you, cannot, you cannot move from there. So now we define GRN to be the minimum of this uh, difference, the number of bases minus this uh, binomial coefficient. So that, that's, that's essentially, this will be the last term of the H vector in a paving metric. So we do this for all the paving metrics of rank R and elements. So this is, this is the first quantity. The second quantity is uh, FRB. That would be the minimum, I, I use the same H, sorry. The minimum of the last entry in a pure of sequence of uh, a multi-complex that contains the full multi-complex of the previous level, so M R minus one D. So what we want to prove is just that G R N is greater than or equal to F R N minus R. Uh, that will prove. Uh, yeah. Can you can you show the definition of G R N? Oh yeah. So G sorry G R N is. Uh, so you, you, you will have the H vector. So you have the H vector of a paving metroid M. So you will have all, all these quantities that are the same as the last term, this HR will have this form. So I want to minimize that. Yeah. A PRN is a set of all- uh, yeah, Paving metroids. Okay, okay. Of rank R and, and elements, okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So our proof and, is is um, uh, is and, well, the theorem is that this works for rank. Uh, sorry, can sorry. can I see the sorry can I see the definition of FRD? Yeah. So uh, F FRD. Then then what you have is that you you have a, a simplicial complex, a multi complex that is full at the beginning, and then you have some points that they make it into the next level of multi-complex. And you want the minimum number of points to, to do that. That's the definition of RFRD. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah. And why Stanley conjecture is is equivalent to uh, like enough to show that statement? Ah, yeah, because because if if you have that you need less points to cover, then you you actually you 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 can define you can take the the the, the multi complex that you want. So what you do is you first create the 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 one with the minimal number of points that makes you a multi complex, and then you add points whatever you want. That 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 will still be a multi complex. Mm -hmm. And uh, okay. because you, you have some lag for, for placing these points, so you have more points, then, then you can add them wherever you want. So you will realize the, the, the edge vector. Okay. Clear? Mm -hmm. And so the proof works for loopless, co loopless, take with metrics. Uh, so we, we show exactly that the uh, ERN is at least FRN N, N minus R. So of course we use that paving methods are closed under minors. So, so our proof is a uh, proof using contraction deletion and of course uh, uh, an induction, okay, a careful induction of, of R plus N. But of course that's not the, that's not enough. We also need a, an extra ingredient that, that that was a work that we did previously with with Laura and um, and our team is that uh, that the structural theorem for rank R colubless paving metroids uh, such that every time that you get an element there. And you delete it, you get a collup. Then there are not that many, that many paving methods with this property, and then you can prove this, this for that, no? and then continue with the induction. So that will be the proof for um, paving metroids. And before I go to co-graphic metroids, let me stay here and mention a conjecture that we got by working on this, um, these multi-complexes. So I'm going to define what is what we call it external multi-complexes. So you take XRD to be the set of these monic monomials over D variables of degree R. So the cardinality, as I mentioned, will be D plus R minus one in R. So now we construct a graph from these monomials. So the, the vertices of this graph, GRD, will be these, these, these monomials, XRD. And two monomials, M and M prime, will be adjacent if the, there are different entries, I and J, such that the variable set I times M is, this, is, is, is the monomial that is uh, the variable set J times M prime. So it's, it's like a basis exchange, uh, act, uh, it's like the basic exchange axiom in basis. So here's an example, G phi three, no, it will be, uh, three variables, um, degree five, we will have uh, seven in five vertices, so 21, and that will be the drawing of the graph. This graph, you can check that it will be, um, uh, the number of variables, if, if it is D, it will be decolorable. And we want to, um, to fix a coloring, we call it the standard coloring of GRD, and that will be the coloring assigning to the, to the monomial set zero to A zero to set D minus one to A, A D minus one. The color that is the dot product of the vector of zero from zero to D minus one times the vector of the exponents of the monomial. And then you take this uh, integer and then you take it mod D. So it's actually easy to check that it's actually a proper coloring. But what we are interested in is a strange quantity that is the F bar of RD, that is the minimum size of a chromatic class in this particular color. So our conjecture was that the F that I define, FRD, is actually the F bar RD, and that was actually the same as the quantity L2RD. L2RD is the number of a periodic binary necklaces with R uh, white bits and D black bits. So for example, with three, uh, in this case, red bits and three black bits, you get these two uh, periodic necklaces. So necklaces are of course an arrangement on the circle of these R plus D points. Um, in, but it's a periodic because if you rotate, you make a rotation of that necklace, uh, that, ne that necklace, is not going to be the same, exactly the same necklace, unless you do a 360 degree tour. So the second part of the conjecture was already known in combinatories of necklaces and hermit reciprocity. These authors, they actually study something more general, that is the quantity AK, AKRD, that is the number of non-negative solutions to this system of equations. 
And, and you can check that precisely the number of monomials in our graph with color K is precisely that number of non-negative solutions. So they prove it indirectly, and this was pointed out by us, by Tristan Bogart, that this L2 RD is actually F bar RD. And, I, and you can prove it more, that it's actually the size of the, of the, of the class with color one. This, the first part of the conjecture, that's the one actually that we were more interested in, is that to, to my knowledge is still open. And with my student Pedro, we managed to get some values done. So we got up to uh, four variables. We also got up to uh, degree four. We got five variables with, uh, uh, sorry, the degree five with, uh, with a lot number of, of variables. So there are just partial results, but uh, we, we think that it, it is, is true, the conjecture. Ah, well, so let me go back. Ah, well, this, is, this is a picture just, just for, for, for to, see, to show that it was very nice. Um, well, let's go back to, to matrix and let's, let's talk about uh, co-graphic metroids and the edge vector of the co-graphic metroids. So let's take a graphic metroid M and, uh, and uh, of, of a graph that is a connected graph with M plus one vertex. So the Laplacian is an integer matrix of n plus one times n plus one, and is defined in the following way. So in the diagonal, in the entry i, you get the degree of the vertex of the vertex v i. So the vertexes are, are, are um, labeled from one to n minus, uh, plus one. And of the diagonal in the entry a j, you get minus the number of edges joining v i and uh, v j. By the way, I'm thinking again, I'm taking out the loops because, uh, 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 but I am going to tell you what happened with the loops. But it, uh, for, for the Laplacian, I'm taking out the loops. So the degree will be, uh, if you want for a graph without the loops or or, or, or other way, you, you, you would put the, the degree minus the, 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 the loops, no? if you consider in, in, in the degree. So you take out two for every loop. And then the reduced Laplacian, uh, uh, once you fix a vertex Q, that is going to be a special in the graph, let's say the M plus one vertex, uh, then you delete the row and column corresponding to that vertex and you get a smaller uh, matrix that is the reduced Laplacian. And it's a result um, probably independently proved by all these people, Kirchhoff, Sylvester, Bouchard, and Maxwell, that the number of bases of this graphic matrix is given by the determinant of the reduced Laplacian. So you can consider an equivalence relation over set N where two configurations uh, of, of integer vectors are related if and only if the difference between these vectors is in the integer span of the reduced Laplacian. So the number of equivalent classes is the determinant of the reduced Laplacian. So you get one class per uh, basis on this graphic metric. So you will hope for uh, choosing representative in each classes associated to these bases. So you will have a representative for each of the bases of the graphic metric, and that will tell you something about the metric. That, of course, is very, very, or extremely uh, difficult that happens. But it did happen when you consider the chief firing game. So the rows of, uh, so I'm going to define the game. So I will consider the reduced Laplacian and the, and the rows of the reduced Laplacian will be RB1 to RBN, so one per vertex. So um, each of these rows will define a room. So you can add minus the row to a configuration sigma that is non-negative. I didn't put that, but it's non-negative. If uh, the difference between sigma and the row VI, uh, the row of VI is non-negative. So that will be the normal rules of the game. We also have a special rule related to the vertex Q that is special and is adding a vector equal to the sum of the rows of LQ. Or if you want to, it's the row of the reduced Lap on the Laplacian of the vertex Q, but without the entry of Q. So this special rule just applies when you cannot use any of the normal rules. So when you play this game, they give you a board. In this case, they give you a connected graph, uh, a marked vertex that is the special vertex Q, in this case in red. They will give you the three normal rules, one per vertex and the special vertex of Q. And to play the game, you just choose uh, 
um, uh, configuration, a non-negative uh, integer vector, let's say three, five, one, and then you start playing the game. So in this case, you can apply the first rule and you go to the configuration one, six, one. So this, you check and you here you can apply the second rule and you go to the configuration two, three, two. And then you keep on doing this, you play the game. Um, and then suddenly you are right to a configuration where you cannot fire or you cannot use any of the normal rules that we call it firing the vertex. Uh, in this case, you get to a configuration that's called a stable configuration because you cannot apply any of the normal rules. So you have to apply the special rule. So you apply the special rule one or more on, and then you get to a configuration where you uh, keep applying the, 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 the rules. And then you continue playing the game. And again, you will arrive to a stable configuration. But you will always arrive to a stable configuration because we are in a connected graph. And of course, you are losing as the, uh, chips or, or you're losing the sum of the entries of the, of the vectors that you are getting when you, get, when you fire vertices that are next to the, to the vertex, special vertex Q. So eventually you will run out of numbers big enough to apply the, root, the normal rules. So you always get to critical, to, to, to a stable configurations. But we also it might happen as, as in this case that you get to the same configuration. So you record in the game to these stable configurations. And these configurations they are called critical configurations. So they are stable. So the, the V entries at most the degree of the vertex minus one, and uh, they record under the chief firing game. Biggs proved that there is a unique critical configuration in each of these con congruent classes. And that there's always a critical configuration that's called the maximal critical configuration sigma m, where the, the value of the vector at the vertex b is the degree of the vertex minus one for every vertex that is not q. Uh, this game uh, it, it appears in mathematics and but also appears in physics uh, and is called the, the sign pile model. And they are totally equivalent. So what it has to do this with metrics? Well, associated to each critical configuration, there is naturally a weight function that is just the sum of the entries. But big realizes that this wasn't exactly the statistic that, that it was related to the metric. So the better statistic was the level of the critical configuration that's the weight of the configuration minus the number of edges plus the degree of Q then the level will be a function between zero and the core rank of the graphic metric. And then with that uh, thinking, then we can define the, what I call the critical configuration polynomial, that will be the generating function of the critical configurations given by level. So I'll just take uh, CIQ to be the number of critical configurations with level I, and then I produce that polynomial P, this polynomial P of GQ, and the variable y. So for example, the diamond graph, so you get some slack. So in the diamond graph, that is k4 minus an h, like in the example that we were working in, uh, we will get eight critical configurations corresponding to the a basis of that graphic metric. That will be one of level two, there will be three of level one, and there will be four of level C. And I can draw them in the space, uh, as you can see. And then the critical configuration polynomial will be y squared plus three y plus four. If you change the, the special vertex Q, the critical configurations will change. But not the number, because that's the number of bases of the metric, but also not the distribution by level. So you will still get one of level two, three of level one, and four of level C. And that's the drawing of the configuration. As you can see, they change, but not the distribution. And then, well, um, I proved in 1997 that one of the reasons that this happened is because this uh, critical configuration polynomial is actually the shelling polynomial of the um, metroid complex of the dual graphic metric. So the co-graphic metric of G. So the idea of the proof is using contraction and deletion. 
So the first thing that you need to know is that the shelling polynomial actually satisfies contraction and deletion. So H of the metric complex of M will be the sum of the H of the shelling polynomials of the metric complex of N minus E and M contracted E when E is not a loop or a co-loop. If you have a loop, the shelling polynomial doesn't change when you delete it. If you have a co-loop, uh, the, the shelling polynomial um, of the original metric complex will be x times, uh, yeah, x times the, the shelling polynomial of the, of the superficial complex with the, H, uh, with the element E contracted. And if you have a loop, then the shelling polynomial will be one. And if you have a loop, will be x. So that, that was very well known at the time. But what I, but I did was to fix an H, uh, Q beam. So I need that the, the special vertex Q is on the H. And let's just consider the case that is uh, not a loop or a loop, and that the vertex V has degree K. Then I can do contraction deletion in the sense that the critical configurations of G with the H E contracted are the projections of the critical configurations with the entry V equals to K minus one, while the rest of the configurations, uh, that means that the configurations with the V entry is strictly less than K minus one, they are exactly the critical configurations of G minus the H E. So in our um, uh, toy example, uh, I will have uh, this, uh, the H joining Q and the second vertex, this, this H, and then the, I make contraction and deletion and they get the configurations on the left. So these configurations will be the configurations of the configurations of um, the, 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 for the graphs, the graph with the edge uh, contracted. Of course, the I have to project this and the rest of the configurations will be the configurations of the edge delete. So finish the, the proof, you just uh, check that then if you consider the maximum critical configuration sigma M and you uh, subtract the critical configuration sigma and you consider all these, all these, uh, all these integer vectors that defines a pure uh, multi-complex. For that, well, you have to check that that was uh, something that's something very easy that if you have a critical configuration and, and there is a stable configuration that is greater than or equal to that, then you also get that sigma prime is critical. But you have to be careful why th that will prove that you get a multi-complex, but why is it a, a pure multi-complex? As because if you have a critical configuration, you play with it uh, uh, and then you, you record and you mark the chips on the game that they make in record, there are, there are some chips that are not they are not used, and and these will let's say stay in the same place. But the other ones that are the one moving, and you mark this, and they, you can check that precisely in number of edges minus degree of Q. So this this gives you a way to construct a, a critical configuration that is less than or equal to the one that you have that is of minimal level. And and before I move on, I I, I have to tell you what happened with the loops. In the case of the loops. What you have is that if you put a loop, then what you have to do is to put two chips or uh, two for each of the loops. And let me change the color. And then you put that two chips here. And then every time you fire or apply the rule for that vertex, uh, the chips stay, uh, let's say, the same, or they, they, they move along the, the loop and they stay in the same, in the same place. So that will happen with the loops. So the loops, in in terms of the, um, uh, it, it doesn't it doesn't create a problem for the critical configurations, but is they are important because um, what you are adding is two things and you are subtracting one thing per edge. So you are you are moving everything by one, and that's very important in the proof because uh, this. Uh, because we are in the co-graphic metroid, these loops will be the co-loops in, in the metroid. So that's why you multiply by X. So that, that, that's very important uh, to mention. So it for the H vector, I noticed that, I, I, that's why I got an, an alarm because I, I, I think I still have time to mention, because all this is unscientific. This is, this is very, very, very old. But uh, I, I get some developed very recently, so it's related to the chip fine game. So I, I, I want to talk a little bit about it. So um, 
uh, if you, uh, probably, I don't know if I, I will have time, but I'll just mention uh, something that is related to the, to the Chiffre game, that's the critical group. So if you have uh, the critical, uh, I mean, if you have two uh, critical configurations, you can uh, define a binary operation by assigning to these uh, two um, critical configurations, uh, the unique critical configuration that is uh, the corresponding one to summing the two configurations entry by entry. This operation, this binary operation makes the critical configuration or gives the structure of an abelian group to the critical configurations. And this group is called the critical group or the sample group. And this group, you can also construct it by, by checking that this actually isomorphic to set an equation, but the integer span, the integer row span of the reduced applash. And this, this group was introduced in several different contexts by Berman, Lorenzini, Dar, Bix, um, Bacher, De La Harp, and Nagy, Veda. So for example, Kn will have a group that is the direct sum of n minus two copies of set n. And this will generalize the famous theorem of K that the number of spanning trees of Kn is n to the n minus two. Well, I was working with um, Ian Moffat and Steve Noble, uh, and they work mainly on ribbon, but at least with me, they work mainly on ribbon graphs. And we managed to, to, to associate a group that we call a critical group for ribbon graphs. So um, a ribbon graph will be a two cellular embedding of uh, a graph G in a closed compact surfaces. And then you take a small neighborhood of the of this embedding and, and you delete the complement and that, that the thing that will have as vertices disk and as edges also something that is uh, topological at disk but you will look at them as, as ribbons. So these are ribbon graphs. Of course, there's a, there's a formal definition of ribbon graphs. And you can always consider just the abstract graph that is given by the ribbon graph. So for example, here in, in the example, you have the, the, the Hewitt graph embedded in the torus. So the things on black will define the ribbon graph and you will delete all the faces uh, color in, in, in the torus. Um, all these graphs, of course, they, they are, there are surfaces with, with, bond, with, with holes, so they will have boundaries. So you count the, comp the boundary components on, on each of these, of these uh, ribbon graphs. And one of the important ones are the ribbon graphs that they have just one boundary component that, I'm, uh, that they are called quasi-trees. We're going to define the group. Just, well, I'm actually not going to define them. I'm going to talk about the group. But this is just um, for ribbon graphs that they are orientable. So they are in orientable surfaces. We don't have a result for, for non-orientable surfaces. So I see that my time is running out, at least for the 50-minute talk. So um, I'm just going to mention that this has to do with delta metrics. I'm not going to stop myself on delta metrics so that people who doesn't um, who does know about the metrics, they will probably appreciate this this relation, and and if not, you can consider delta metric is some sort of generalization of, of metrics. And these ribbon graphs, when you consider all the spanning quasi trees, they define the feasible sets of a delta metric. So um, this this is this is an example of a of a of a ribbon graph. Um, and the, um, the delta matrix associated to this, it will have three elements, no, one per H, and the feasible sets will be the three singletons and the whole uh, set. So it looks quite different from, from a metroid, with actually the basis of a metroid, they define a delta matrix. So I, in, 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 um, in delta metric, there's the notion of uh, twist. So you, you get uh, a different delta metric by considering the symmetric difference with a fixed set A. So that operation goes through in, in ribbon graphs and it's called the partial dual. So you can construct from one um, ribbon graph, a partial dual to respect to some subset of the elements and get a new partial dual. The important thing here is that this is some sort of generalization of the geometric dual when you have a um, planar graph and you consider a geometric dual. 
then uh, it happens that the metroid of the original graph will be the dual of the metroid of the, of the geometric dual. And so we have that here. We also have a dual of a ribbon graph. And when, when the graph is embedded in the sphere, it will be uh, the, the corresponding ribbon graph of the geometric dual of the graph that you start with. So you finish taking the result. Sorry, I didn't have uh, time to, to talk about uh, in, in length. And this finishing test. So if you have an orient, uh, orientable ribbon graph, we actually can find uh, an abelian group uh, such that uh, First, the order of the group equals to the number of spanning quasi trees of the ribbon graph. So that will be the generalization of the critical group, no? Because the critical group will be the order will be precisely the number of spanning trees of the graph that you do, that you start with. We also have in the case of that the the, the ribbon graph is planar, then it actually the the, the group is there's no topological information there, so the group is actually the same as the, uh, the, the classical critical group of the abstract graph of Jim. And uh, also, if you have uh, the critical group of the ribbon graph G, that will be isomorphic to the critical group of the dual uh, ribbon graph. And in fact, of any of the partial duals of that ribbon graph. I'm sorry that I, I run uh, on this last bit. Uh, just to mention that the group of this 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 uh, ribbon graph is set to uh, uh, set two, and that will be the end of my talk. Thank you very much. Let's thank the speaker. Any questions from the audience? I wonder if I can ask uh, um, a question about what, what if is your uh, critical group for the ribbon graph also the co kernel of some some integer matrix? Um, you didn't say how you yes, define it. Exactly. Yeah. Sorry, I, I didn't define it, but yes, exactly. It is a co kernel of, of of some integer matrix. Yeah. It's actually related to the to the fact that the um, the the ribbon graphs are as 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 delta matrix are representable over the, um, the, the real by, uh, by principal unimodular matrices. So essentially that is the, the, the matrix that we're using some modification to get the, the well, what will be the matrix, no? Instead of the, the reduced oppression, it will be this. Thanks. Okay, so that's the matrix that kind of give you a chip firing on ribbon graphs, is that? Sorry? Is that so that would be the matrix giving you a kind of chip firing on the ribbon graphs. Yeah, so yeah, this, this, this is an interesting object because, well, I, I don't want to go too much into it, but we, we actually have a realization of the group as a chip firing, but no, not through that matrix that I mentioned. Through another, through another matrix, you can get a chip firing. That that is achieved firing in an Eulerian uh, directed graph. Um, I have two more questions. So, um, uh, so the so H vector. I mean, so for some classes that you mentioned that the H vector is an O sequence, is the property of being an O sequence preserve? I mean, what kind of operation matrix of metroid operations? Do we know that the property of H vector being an O sequence is preserved? Oh, I don't think that many. I don't. I don't. I don't uh, no, I don't know. No, you. You will. I mean, I, I. I tried several things, but I don't think none of them work. Apart from the trivial ones of the loops and co-loops, possible parallel ledges, and I'm not quite sure even about that. No, because this is not 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 easy. No, no, I, 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 I will say I don't know. I will think that there, essentially, there are very difficult results. Okay, interesting, very interesting. And one more question about your result of getting the uh, h vector as a h vector of the dual uh, 
graph as a uh, generating function of critical uh, configurations can yeah. is there do you think there's a possibility of like having some statistics defined on uh, on the on the config chip firing game to get the whole tet polynomial or is that not possible ah huh. now that you ask that i will think that hmm. I don't know. I will say that I don't know, but I don't. Uh, but I think that 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 sounds familiar. So it is possible. It is possible that you can do that. I'm I'm not quite sure, but I will say that I don't know. Okay. Uh, I okay. So I think that's all of my questions. If there are other questions from the audience. I, yes, I, have a, I have a quick question, and, and that is, is there, a, is there a paper or a preprint with this, all this in it? Sorry, there's some interference. Can you say I'm it again? Asking, I'm asking if there is a paper or a preprint with this in it. With the... With the result of the paving metric is, is published is published in 2012 and the co-graphic metrics is published in, two, in 1997 and the one of the ribbon graphs we are just finishing writing okay of course i can send you the papers if you want to yeah Any any other questions from the audience? Uh, Margaret, he was saying that he can send you the paper if you would like to have it. Uh, we can't hear Margaret. Um, uh, uh, yeah, I, I, I can write and ask for them. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. Okay, thanks. Thanks a lot, uh, all of you for coming. Um, have a nice weekend and we'll meet on Tuesday. Okay, thank you. Bye. Uh, thanks, Ryle. Very good talk. Yeah, thank you.